go into that. But show me the I'll give you a cup of good coffee. There we go. Okay, let's warmly welcome Ellen. Yeah. Thanks, Bonnie. Give me a hug. Thank you. Mike. Okay. Let me use this because I think it's better. How y'all doing tonight? Yeah. How y'all doing tonight? Yes, sir. All right. Woo! Mm. We're moving to Oklahoma. Yeah. So I'm starting to learn to talk like this. Yes, sir. There's an armadillo right over there. I'm going to shoot him. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Mm. These things just just kind of manifest every now and then. You can pray for me. We'll call Russ Dizdar in. I'll get deliverance. I'm just joking. Okay, so here's Mysterious Mound Builders. This is the trailer. Oh, it's not the trailer. I have no idea what we're doing here. All right, let me start over again. This is Mysterious Mound Builders. How many people were here uh, this afternoon? Just give me a show. So you kind of know where we're going with this, right? Good. All right. Our manifesto, for lack of a better word, our mission statement, to expose the deception of the prince of the power of the air and to herald the return of the king, Yeshua, Jesus. And the reason, when you see this, this is hidden in plain sight. Now, we talked about UFOs earlier, and Tucker Carlson and, and what was there, okay, on Fox News. That's disclosure, and it's ongoing. So something is coming. I don't need to, you know, beat a dead horse there or, or reiterate it. I think you guys got it. But this is something different. Hopefully this will play. Let's see. Here we go. Who made these ancient monuments? And we'll see the Great Serpent Mound just in a couple of minutes. Where did the builders go? Cahokia, Monk's Mound, the largest earthen mound in the world. Why can they only be seen from the air? The North Earthworks, three miles rectangle, three miles square of earthworks. Poverty Point, the second largest mound, 390,000 tons of earth. Has there been a deliverer cover-up? That's what we're going to look at tonight. Bam. Two millennia ago, a culture that is still unknown to us today erected thousands of mounds throughout the Midwestern United States to the Gulf of Mexico. They're called the Hopewell, the Adena, or the Mississippian. However, no one knows what these people actually call themselves. In other words, they remain mysterious to us today. Here's the deal. Modern day archaeologists use these words like Hopewell, the Adina, the Mississippian. They have no flipping idea what the people who build this stuff were actually called. So if you don't know who they were, hello, how can you say anything about them? And this is what we're supposed to believe. This is the narrative. This is academia, LA. This is science. But it's true. This is what, this is the problem that they feed us. They don't know what they call themselves, so they make up a name. Hopewell was the farmer where he discovered the artifacts, and from that, they named this entire culture the Hopewell culture. Adina, the same thing. Mississippian. The Woodland era. I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable. And because they're all part of the same club, they all pat each other on the back. Until you get some guy like me, who doesn't have an archaeological degree, so I'm not biased or jaded, as it were. I'm not, you know, in lockstep with the whole deal. And I'm looking at the stuff, scratching my head, I'm going, something doesn't add up here. Guys, you're drinking the Kool-Aid. And that's, and, and look, come here, come here tonight with an open, skeptical mind. I mean, open mind in the sense of, okay, what's, what's Marzulli up to now? Be skeptical. You tell me afterwards, whatever, where I'm going wrong. All right, let's get into it. So, when the first white settlers came to the Great Circle Mount in Ohio, they asked the Native Americans living there, who built this? This is a matter of historical record. The natives replied that they didn't know who built them as these large earth mounds were there and abandoned when they arrived. We hear this over and over and over again. Native Americans come in and there's this huge earth mound. They have no idea who built it. The discovery of these mounds created a controversy as some posited the mounds were built by an unknown lost tribe of people who migrated perhaps from the old world. Others thought they could be one of the lost tribes of Israel. This debate continued until the late part of the 19th century, here it comes, when the conclusion was made that Native Americans had built the mounds, but they had simply forgotten that they had done so. <laughs> I swear to you, I swear to you, that is the prevailing paradigm. I swear, I'm not making this up, I wish I was. 
And, and why is it that, well, you're not schooled archaeologists out there. You're just dumb sheeple. Why are you laughing at this? And that's, the, if, if archaeologists were up, they'd be insulted by the fact that you're laughing. But that's, I mean, that's how laughable it is. It's just, what are these, what are these, how can they sit there and look at you with a straight face and tell you this? But this is, this is the narrative, and I'm not making this up. Okay, this is now the accepted paradigm, however. Is it the truth of what occurred in the ancient past, or has the information been managed, deliberately managed, to bolster a particular narrative? Join us as we explore the mysterious mound builders. This is a shot from the 50s. This is the Bolger family. They were out on this shell mound on Tick Island in Florida. It was a huge earthen mound, three stories high, at least three acres. They're out there. They had the largest, the second largest collection of artifacts in Florida. All right. And as they're there, there we go. Bolger family pastime. And as they're there, they discover these grades. Well, this guy gets a hold of me, and he's got eight millimeter film. That his and his and his mother was the camera person, okay, the camera girl. So she's taken this. It's like sixteen millimeter film. It's not even eight. Sixteen millimeter film, okay. Maybe it's eight. Whatever it was. So he sends me. He sends me the reels, and I send them over to. Uh, a, a company in Hollywood which takes the reels and digitizes it and I go through this thing and I'm hoping I'm hoping I'm hoping we hit some pay dirt but not what we could have so in the, in the film there's an audio of recording of, of, mis, of this guy and myself Mr. Bilger and myself and he's telling me that when they were kids okay they dug into the mound and they found ten footers they found 10 footers, and I'm going, did you film it? And he said, well, I don't know, my mom had the camera. And he hadn't looked at the film for like 50 years or whatever. And then he sent the film to me. What we found, we didn't find the giants, but we found the next best thing, and it's in the film. And he talks about elongated skulls, elongated skulls. And there's a picture, and, it, and it's really brief. The archeologist has a brush, and he's brushing the top of the skull, and it's clearly elongated. Was it? We don't know whether it's cranial deformation, whether it was Nephilim, we don't know what it is because it's just a, a real quick clip. But he comes on the record and he says that they tried to tell the archaeologist that, no, dig over here. This is where the nine, ten footers are. And he comes on the record and he says they were at least ten feet tall. They said that the, the, the femur bone came up to his waist as a child. A normal femur bone is 18 inches. The ones in Paracas were 16, even smaller. Modern femur bones about 18 inches. These, the femur bone, he's a kid, but came up to his waist. What are we looking at here? That's Tick Island. So that's just, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And we know there's artifacts that are out there. We know that, that families have artifacts. We know this because we get calls from people from time to time, and we go out and we investigate stuff. And sometimes people don't know what they're sitting on, but they're sitting on something that, that could be really valuable to the research. Who is the prince of the power of the air? The dragon is the prince of the power of the air. In Genesis 3.15 it says, and we talked about this before, but this is my key verse because it then dovetails into Genesis 6. Genesis 3.15, Yeshua is there in the garden. Adam and Eve just totally blew it because Eve was deceived. There was a little thing that I wrote a while back again. The dragon will lie and create deception. It will look so good, so logical, so wonderful, and once we bite, just like Eve did, it's over. It leads to death. And we don't know how long the dragon whispered to Eve. She wasn't afraid of it. She obviously had seen this thing before and obviously conversed with it. But for whatever reason, he finally lures her in. God really didn't say that, did he? <laughs> and she, she goes for it. And the rest is history. So Yeshua is there, Adam and Eve are over here, then the Kosh, the shining one, is over there, and we get this whole mandate which sets up the rest of the biblical prophetic narrative. If we don't come to a grip, to grips, and an understanding of Genesis 3.15, in my opinion, you won't understand the rest of the Bible. Who's the, let's work backwards, who's the Antichrist? Who's the son of perdition? Hmm? And you just start working backwards. Why is it that, in, that a mandate comes down in Canaan to Joshua and Caleb to wipe out all the inhabitants in the promised land. That's genocidal. 
And unless we understand Genesis 3.15, we won't understand what happens when we get to Canaan. We won't understand the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We, don't, we won't understand the five kings that Abraham goes up against. We won't understand anything when it comes to the Nephilim. And then three chapters later, we get to the Nephilim. We get Genesis 6. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. They took wives from wherever they chose. And they had children by them. He was the men of renown. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterwards, when the sons of God, the fallen angels, took wives and had children by them. These were the mighty men of renown. These were the Nephilim. And this, this, this is what we're up against. And that, that verse is, is key to understanding that there's a seed war. Because... That in that scene with Adam and Eve over here, Yeshua is here, and the serpent is over there, he utters this mandate. Your seed, pointing to the serpent, will be at war and enmity with the seed of the woman. He, Messiah, Mashiach, will crush your head. Will crush your head. You bruise his heel. There it is. There, that's the whole Bible in, in thousands of years that's what this whole thing is. Nakash the dragon knows someone is coming who is going to crush his head. So what does he do? And this is the three hour conversation. He tries to pollute the genome. He tries to pollute the DNA. So the seed of the woman will be corrupted. And if it's corrupted, Mashiach can't possibly come through a corrupted line. Over, game wins, planet's mine. Thank you, everybody go home. That's, that's what's at stake here. That is the reality. And this is why... He positions his hybrid entities, known as the Nephilim, in strategic places. This is why they are in Canaan. Because two things. Once the dragon knows, think about this. Once the dragon knows where the line's going to be, he doesn't know until Abraham is tapped out. Think about this. Think about this. He doesn't know. He knows it's coming, but he doesn't know where it's coming. And so he can't. He tries to destroy the seed. He tries to do it before the flood. He's wiped out. Then after the flood in Sodom and Gomorrah, the Tower of Babel, same thing. They're doing the same thing with Nimrod becomes a mighty man. They're opening up a gateway. Instead of wiping everybody out with the flood, he just confuses the language. Ever wonder how he does that? You see, we read that stuff and we go, wait a minute. What button does he push? No one was speaking uh, Japanese. I mean, how does that work? How does that work? And you know what? When he comes back, He's going to flip the switch again, and we're all going to be speaking the same language. Because I'm not running around with a stinking translator collar on. I'm telling you that right now. I'm not doing that. So somehow he's going to, he's going to flip the switch. I mean, this is, this is, this is where we are. It's, uh, the stuff we believe is beyond science fiction. I mean, it just is. And it's crazy stuff. It confuses the language of Babel. And the skeptical to that and goes, yeah, right. What are you guys smoking? I believe it. Because that's, he's supernatural. And he created all this. So if he wants to flip a switch someplace, which I don't think he does, but however he does it, he does it, and everybody winds up speaking all these different languages. I mean, it's wacky stuff. So that mandate comes down. The serpent, we, hear, we learn later, you'll crawl on your belly, eat the dust of the earth, the whole thing. This is near people's, oops, sorry. This right here is called the Great Serpent Mound. This is a drawing from the 19th century. What are you looking at there? Here's a waterway down here. I've been there like three or four times. And when you go to these places, you get prayed up. In the parking lot, you get prayed up. You make sure nothing comes through the ground through you or above, down, below you. We were there at the, at the spring equinox. There was a coven of Wiccans that were there. They know exactly what that place is. And they were working their stuff. And we prayed against it. We flew the drone. We ran all over the place and filmed, and a lot of it is, is, in, is in the film, but we don't have it here. We forgot to bring them. Shame on us. But you can order it online, lamarzuli.net, if you're interested. This is the first in the series on the trail of a Nephilim. We're looking at 20 shows minimum, at least four to five a year, depending on how quick I can get the editing done. And we're, I'm really excited about this because we're, we're pushing back against ancient aliens. We're pushing back against the Darwinists. We're pushing back against what mainstream archaeology says. And we're pointing back to the validity and the veracity of the biblical prophetic narrative. So what do you see here? You see a serpent that's coiled. And what's this? What is that? What does that look like to you? The serpent is in the act of swallowing the egg, the seed of the woman the seed of the woman. 
The serpent is in the act of swallowing the seed of the woman. Why can you only see this from the air? Who is the prince of the power of the air? Why, why erect a serpent motif with a serpent's mouth wide open in the act of swallowing an egg? It hails back to Genesis 3.15, and no one put that together till very recently. And our team is the team that did it. In particular, one amateur archaeologist, after hearing Gary Stearman at a Nephilim Mounds conference in Ohio, had just been out to the serpent mound, and he said, oh my gosh, and the, and, and the light bulb went off when he came and he told me, and we published it in the book. No one, no archaeologist has ever, ever put that together. It, go, it hails directly back to Genesis 3.15. Why? Because it says, the serpent will destroy the egg. The serpent will destroy the seed. I will win. I will ascend. I will do this. I will do that. I will be in the, in the, in the council of the Most High. That whole thing, the five I wills, that's what this points to. That's what it is, and you can only see it from the air. And I'll show you this in a second. Here we go. This is from the internet. I did not do this particular drone footage, but it's great drone footage. You look at the tail here, and right there is the two-story tower. See it? So when you stand in the tower, you can kind of get a, a feel for what you're looking at, but you don't see it until you're high above it, like a couple of hundred feet. When you're down on the ground and you, and you look at this, you, you, when you come here, you, you have no idea what you're looking at because it's not meant to be seen from the ground. You can only appreciate the serpent's undulation, and this thing is like huge. You can see the pathway here that goes around it. This thing is huge. And these humps that you'll see here, and I'll point this out, point to the equinoxes. Native Americans didn't travel on this stuff. Watch when it, when it goes up higher and it, and it passes and you really get the whole feel of what you're looking at. It's in a high place that overlooks a waterway. And you can see the undulations and there's the head. There's the waterway here. And there's the seed right there, the egg, the seed of the woman. There you go. Now you're up a couple of hundred feet at least. And now you can see it. Why create something that you can only see from the air when you don't have a hot air balloon or an airplane? See where I'm going with this? Why would you make it? Why? Well, I, I don't know, LA. It's, it looks pretty good on the ground here. Nonsense. You wouldn't do it. We're looking at the fingerprints of a supernatural right here in our own country, in Ohio, for crying out loud. It's in Ohio. And this is closer. This is some of what my drone footage looks like right in here. These are the undulations of a serpent mound. And you finally get up to the head in the act of swallowing the egg. This is Genesis 3.15 screaming at us. The fallen angels did this for the prince of the power of the air because you can only see it from the air. And when you tell archaeologists this, they just kind of laugh at you. They scoff because, you know, they're all a bunch of Darwinists. They don't believe any of this stuff. They don't believe in the supernatural. They don't believe in the God of the Bible. They don't believe in an ultimate right or wrong. And so they don't want to go there. And they're all, they're all trained to this one particular paradigm. But that just gives you an idea. Look at the little person like right there. There's the two-story two tower. It gives you an idea of what you're looking at. So here we have the serpent mound, winter solstice, equinox, summer solstice, and right here is the summer solstice um, setting of the sun with the egg and the serpent. It's all deliberate. It's absolutely all deliberate. So how were Native Americans supposed to do this? How do they check their work? How do they know how any of this works? They can't. I mean, I talked to Chief Joseph River when he comes, he's Native American, Tiano tribe, and he comes on the, on the record in the film. And he just says Native Americans didn't do this. So the latest, when we were there in the spring equinox, it was really cold, by the way. Oh. And there's all this new signage, which we had never seen before. And I'm going, oh my gosh, look what, look what the signs are saying, that the Shawnee built the serpent mound. Well, Chief Joseph said, well, that's a bunch of hooey, because Chief Wallace of the Shawnee, in print, in, the, in, the, in, in this Native American journal that's published quarterly, states, in print, that while we respected the mounds and, and looked at them as caretakers, quote, 
we did not build the Serpent Mount. So who do we believe? The archaeologists and the anthropologists who have an axe to grind? Or do we believe the Shawnee? And of course, their, their great catch-all is, well, the Shawnee just forgot that they had built it. <laughs> How convenient is that? Meanwhile, the Shawnee storytellers will tell you their oral history, because it's down from person to person to person to person to person, and they don't add or subtract a word. But somehow that's not valid because there's no written history. There's no written language. Nonsense. Of course it's valid. But new, some of these anthropologists that are coming through are going, maybe we should rethink this and start listening to some of the old stories. Cahokia is the largest earthen mound in America. It's probably upwards of, I'm going to guess, 450,000 tons of earth. And when we're there, we get the party line. This is the party line, okay? Native Americans took primitive tools, the shoulder and clamshells, and dug the earth, and built birch bark baskets, or used deer hide, and put the dirt in the deer hide in the birch bark basket, and did them one basket at a time to create the mounds. So you go, well, has anybody actually taken a hoe and tried to do this? Well, no, but that's how it was done. Oh. So as I said yesterday, we hired a flint napper, a guy who creates museum pieces, which burned in the fire. And he created a hoe, a beautiful replica of the hoe that was used 6,000 years ago, or 5,000 years ago, to create a mound, let's say, like Cahokia. By the way, the, this plaza around Cahokia is 45 acres. My back, my lower back is really killing me. So when I bend over like that, I'm just trying to flex it. I am in great pain, but for you, I am going to suffer. <laughs> Don't try to stop me, Schmid. So, it's a 45-acre plaza, and the thing is level within two inches. How is that done? How is it? 45-acre plaza, two inches? Eh, I'm not buying it. 450,000 tons of earth? And, and how do they compact the earth? And how do they know what they're looking at? You say, well, that's what they did. They used, they used clamshells, and you'll see. <laughs> this is, I'm here with Josh Tolley at Cahokia, on top of the mound. So we thought, well, we not. <laughs> so I'm like, what are we doing here? More importantly, what are you doing? Well, and this is part of my ongoing research with On the Trail of the Nepaline. This is Cahokia. Um, it's been on my bucket list of sites to go visit for quite some time, and it's just great to be here. Um, as in all of these places that I've ever visited, most of them are right by a waterway. The Mississippi is off to my left here. Um, you can see the archway in the background. Below. See it right there? We are up on top of what they call... Look at the, look, look how big it is. Or it's completely erroneous because uh, they call it Monk's Mountain because of the Catholic Church and the monks that were here. They don't know who built this complex. They really have no idea who built it. They call it the Hopewell because just like the Hopewell Indians in Ohio. Hopewell was a farmer. They don't know what the people who built the mountains in Ohio were really called. So they make names up, like the Hopewell, like the Indina, like Cahokia. They just make these names up. And no one really knows who the people you were. You can see the plaza all around me, how, how flat it is. Constructed. And the reason why I'm here, this all goes back into the mound culture. I believe that there is a history See the people on top? throughout <laughs> the world, which has been deliberately obfuscated for the people of the world. And part of being on the this is the staircase that they put in. There's nothing like boots on the ground, folks. When you're here, it gives you an idea just how big this thing is, how enormous it is. I can see for miles, literally for miles up here. It's absolutely incredible. And of course, it's a very, uh, the complex has many different mounds on it. And it reminds me of the other places I've been, like Teal Tico Khan in Mexico, and then, of course, um, Corral down in Peru. There's a similarity. Many stream archaeologists will tell us that Look at the plaza. was constructed over a period of decades, maybe a couple of hundred years, by Native Americans allegedly, with burnt bark baskets, however big they were, and clamshells, and stone hoes, and they dug the dirt and they hauled it. But, and I, I asked one of the ghost sets in there, I said, listen, 
Then you've got engineering, you've got building techniques, you've got advanced mathematics. Yeah. And there's no pre-existing culture. All this just rises up out of nowhere. Yeah. And Let me address that. This culture, there's, and we'll get into this in a little bit, there's advanced trigonometry in some of the sites. There's, there's knowledge of lunar precession, 18 and a half year lunar cycle. In order to do that, you've got to stand watch the moon and understand where it rises and falls and the whole thing waxes and wanes and then somehow record that for 18 and a half years to figure out that's an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. I mean, how do you do that? You can do it today in modernity. You can make things like this. We have trigonometry. But you go back thousands of years ago, let me see, Native Americans figured out what trigonometry was and then promptly forgot. It just, it just doesn't make any sense. The whole thing collapses of its own weight. 390,000 tons of earth in the second largest mountain. It's called Poverty Point. Again, this is, this is older than Cahokia. Poverty Point is actually older than Cahokia. No one knows who these people were, what they called themselves, where they came from. Nobody knows. And what's really interesting, this is really, really interesting. And no one knows what this is, and I don't either. There's something... There are these little mounds, and they, this whole area was plowed over and over and over again, but they couldn't erase the mounds completely. These mounds here are very shallow, maybe two or three feet high, and they create, it looks like an amphitheater, but they don't know what it really is. And when you start looking at, at, the, at the, the shapes, the geometric patterns that are through here, this is by design. And again, the only way you can see this is from the air. So here's Mound A, 390,000 tons of earth. Fort Ancient, when we got there last year, it was the spring equinox, all right? The sun was coming up. We were standing in the gate. There's two large mounds, probably 30, 40 feet in diameter. One's here, one's on this side. The road runs right through it. It's directly due east and west. So my wife takes out her her star chart on his, on his cell phone. And you know what, what constellation was coming on the spring equinox right over the gate? Hydra the serpent. It's deliberate. And as, as Stephen was talking about, when you read the book of Enoch, this is fallen angel technology, Nephilim architecture, in my opinion. Everything I'm showing you tonight, in my opinion, is fallen angel technology, Nephilim architecture. Fort Ancient, when we got out of the car, and we only explored probably to here, and there's a parking lot, this is down in the woods, and, and the, the, east, the gate goes something like this. No, the gate's up here, I'm sorry. See the mounds? This is where the, 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 this is where the um, Peggy stood about here in the middle of the road. We spotted the cars. The hydro serpent was coming up. So here's where we, we were parked probably somewhere in this area like right in here. This is uh, on the other side of the road, okay? And we explored down into here. Um, these mounds, when I got out of the car, and I, I, we flew the drone, and I just sat there with my jaw on the ground. These mounds here are over 3.5 miles of earthen walls, and there are, and this is, this is uh, a subject of debate, are there 67 gates or 66 gates? <laughs> what is it really? What is it really? And we don't know, because some of the evidence may have been, but there are gates. They call it, they call it Fort Ancient, but it's not a fort, because you don't build a fort with gates. And what I mean by gates, there's the mounds, a mound will be here and a mound will be there, and it'll be like an area of like 20 feet between them. Well, that's not a fort. Something else is going on. And so they don't, first of all, they have no idea who built it. Second of all, they just make stuff up, in my opinion. Questions later. Questions later. So Fort Ancient is an absolute mind blower. And these are, these are older pictures of what it used to look like. Give you an idea, just the enormity of the mounds. 